Hi, my name is Carlo Barbieri. I work in the Engine Connectivity Engineering Group, and, uh, and this is a workshop on databases. So yeah, relational databases. Um, if you want to follow along and evaluate the stuff, unlike the other one that had you know, a server running on my machine, this one is stuff that you can evaluate on your machine because we're not going to connect to an external database, but we're going to use an SQLite example database that's present in the layout in example data. So if you want to follow along, it's not going to be as interactive as the uh, nice uh, workshop on external evaluate that Ricardo and Todd did yesterday, but it's going to be more, more lecture style and less, uh, you know, exercise style. But so um, first I'm going to talk about the philosophy of, of uh, the way we approached connecting to databases in the Wolfram language. Uh, and then I'm going to go into what classes of entities are, inspection, uh, querying, relations. I don't know if those things speak to you, but they will after I get in the details. Ouch. <laughs> so what is the philosophy of this? Um, so um, object-oriented programming languages have things called ORMs, which are an object relational uh, M is model. model. No, what is it? Model. model. Okay. We don't really have objects in the Wolfram language, or rather, they're not the na most native way to think about this stuff. Um, so, so what do we have? When we started working on 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 this on 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 connected to SQL, we already had a precedent for an entity property framework. And what an entity property framework does is that basically there is this resolver function called entity value, and it takes a first argument, and the first argument are classes of entities or lists of entities or single entities, and they represent the rows of the data. Uh, so if you imagine a table, these are rows in the table. And the, the, the first argument is in general, an object that is fully inert and symbolic and represents what, you want to get out of a given table and what table you want to get it out of. And then the second argument, the properties, are what is called in relational algebra, the projection. So what columns you want out of that table. So these two things form a kind of the algebraic, underlying algebraic structure of relational algebra, and they're exposed in a way that is slightly different in an entity relational model. Um, so the principles are, and this is this part of the principle is more mathematical like. Before you call entity value, anything is inert and symbolic. You can do meta programming with it, you can do all sorts of stuff, you can construct it, you know, like Lego blocks. And only when you call entity value, things happen. Uh, then in the in the database world, we consider entity value dangerous because it's like, sorry, entity value, entity list dangers, because reasoning about single entities is something you want to avoid because it leads to inefficiencies. And so in general, what people do is like, oh, I want all the countries in G8, let me do entity list so that I get the actual countries. And then after they've done that, they ask for the properties of that list of entities. That thing is really not necessary because you can pass the symbolic representation of the countries in Europe, and basically each single call to entity value, and in a sense, entity list is a very special call to entity value, is a single query. So if you do the thing in two steps, calling entity list first and entity value after, you might, you, I mean, this is something that really doesn't happen when you're dealing with the, the built in entities like countries because they change very slowly. But if you're in a situation where, you know, it's you're talking to a database which has customer orders and that they, and they come a hundred a second, a hundred new orders that then get resolved. Atomicity is very important. And so doing this two-step process means that, you know, maybe first time selecting which orders are currently active and then getting the properties of them. You do that, it got out of sync and some orders are no longer active because they've been dispatched in the meantime, in the millisecond that it took for going from one call to the other. So try to avoid entity list, try do, to do everything in a single call. 
uh, we'll, we'll get more in detail of the, how to achieve that to construct things first symbolically and then boom executed in a single go Ouch. maybe if i remove my shoes it's... and okay so what are the classes of entities that we have so entity class is the one most of you will already be familiar with which supports well there are either named entity classes like g8 or uh, entity classes support basic filtering and uh, basic sorting so in general they use predicates like you know you can say entity class country population goes to greater than a billion and then you get india and china out of it uh, or you can say uh you know you, you can ask for things to be sorted by some, some parameter and you can get a mix of those things and i never quite remember whether putting multiple condition ors them or ends them so but you can only do one of the two i think it's end so it, it gets more restrictive if you put more filters um if on the other hand you want better control on the logical operators when you do filtering you can use filtered entity class which takes a, a an entity function as the second argument in the entity function you can pretty much put whatever boolean logic you want and we will compile that for you to sql and uh, when i say pretty much anything it's because we are actually using uh, the symbolic capabilities of mathematica and so you can uh, you know there, there's there's extensive stuff like boolean function with four arguments number 15 and it's like uh, based from the truth value and that gets compiled into ends and ors by using conjunctive normal form so we do really rely on a lot of uh, symbolic transformation that that are in mathematics and that wouldn't be otherwise supported in 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 sql uh, so in, in, instead extended entity class is something that you use to add a kind of a virtual property to a table so it's a, it's like an annotation suppose you have countries with population and 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 and, and area surface area then you can compute the uh, you can compute the the density and you do it once and you can then reuse it in subsequent queries that are wrapped around this first query um, sample density class it's like something that you use to, to, to it's what in, in sql is called limit and offset it's basically the same syntax as stake in the wolfram language so it, it's used to get the first few things out of a query the difference why we didn't the reason why we didn't call it something that resembled take is that SQL doesn't really give you any guarantee of reproducible order unless you explicitly sort. So uh, uh, keep, you, keep that in mind that subsequent queries that look identical, if the data has changed, there's no guarantee that the server will give you the same thing twice. So it's a sample, uh, though not a random one. Uh, uh, sorted entity classes is order by, it's like pretty trivial. And, and then we have aggregations aggregations are things where you say it's a little bit like group by in the Wolfram language except group by is hierarchical and so aggregate so this aggregation keeps things flat so it stays it comes in as, a, as an entity class and comes out as an entity class and this is pretty much the principle of all of these functions they're like lego bricks they are homeomorphisms in the space of of, of tables so you, you they most of them take one entity class and return an entity class. I mean, they don't return, they represent because they are inert constructs. They don't evaluate. And the last one, which is probably the most complicated uh, uh, is uh, combined entity class. I mean, it's not the last, why did I say the last? But it's the most complicated because it's the only one that takes two entity classes and does what is called join in SQL or join across in the Wolfram language. And, and it does basically various version of outer products of all the properties of one and the other. So it's a powerful tool, but uh, it's to be used with uh, a little bit of knowledge of what you're doing. And then we have um, three more entity classes that correspond to the set operations in the Wolfram language. Uh, and that have like, they have this thing called same set properties, which is like, just like union, intersect, uh, intersection and, and complement have a same test. Uh, here we define uh, we, we actually define properties so that you can say what what are the properties that i have to look at to consider these two things equal and by default this will use the canonical name 
or the primary key, uh, but uh, in some cases it doesn't work because maybe you are unioning two things which have uh, entity, sorry, which have canonical names that are not comparable because maybe one is strings and the other is integers. And so what does it even mean to compare them? But you can say, oh, I want to use another property to, to, to do the union of these or to do the intersection. So these are extremely powerful. You can also like, one thing that many people don't realize is like union can take like the same in the Wolfram language, union can take one argument and use to delete duplicates. It's a sorted version of delete duplicates and or can take multiple arguments. And it's basically you're doing one operation, you're doing a join and then a delete duplicates and then a sort. So it's like, it's the same here. By, by using clever tricks, you can use this as delete duplicates by because you use the same set properties to decide what you're gonna consider the equality function. So this is the zoo of functions that you have to compose your queries. And uh, it's not exactly like using select or using join or using delete duplicates, but th there, are, there is some parallelism. And the thing that, that makes it really different is that you iteratively build on things that are fully symbolic and only execute at the end. So it's a little bit less of a, an interactive and experimental thing which is a good thing because sometimes you have data sets that are one terabyte. And until you've drilled down and selected things, you really don't want to bring things into memory to figure out whether they work. Though we give you tools like sample entity class so you can experiment a little bit. So you take the first 10 rows and see if everything is good. And only then when you convince that you've built the right thing, then you execute the full thing. Are there questions so far? No, 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 this is, uh, so the question is whether Wolfram Alpha uses this. And the answer is, uh, well, this came after Wolfram Alpha. So basically if you're using this on a built, like on the built-in entity types, some of this will work server side, some others will work uh, kernel side. So you will first have to bring all the data in and then do the computation locally, which is very slow in some cases. If you're not happy about it, the person to bug is Jeremy. Uh, uh, on the other hand, if you're using your own SQL ser server somewhere or uh, an SQL Lite file, it's, it's gonna all happen out of core. And so in that case, it's, uh, so alpha doesn't support all of this. This is much more useful if you have your own SQL database. Okay. Okay, onward. Oh, shocked again. <laughs> okay, so I said this before, they're like Lego, they all have the same type. So, you know, you can, comp all of them are composable with all of the others. Uh, they're inert and symbolic, so you can do metaprogramming is that's what you're into. And, uh, and, and the other advantage that will maybe become a little bit clearer later is that you can, by just looking at the symbolic structure, you can reason about what entity properties they have. So for example, if you look at extended entity class, extended entity class, what it does it, is that it adds one or more properties to the entity class that comes in its first argument. And so basically once you know what the first argument has in terms of properties, then you can recursively tell what properties were added at each step of this big onion of queries. And so in general, what happens is that you have performed an inspection, which is the next topic we're gonna cover. So you know each database table has a given set of properties and to know what properties will come out of very complicated query, you just need to statically analyze the, the entity class structure and you don't need to perform any query to just know the properties. So this is a very big advantage of in general, the work from language kind of functional, symbolic, recursive kind of programming. Ouch. I think I'm gonna break my computer at some point by like with a static electricity. Okay, so how does um, inspection work? So this is, uh, I mean, we're connecting out to an SQL, SQL Lite file, but we do support Postgres, MySQL, and MariaDB, um, Microsoft Server, Oracle, and I hope I didn't forget any of them, but the major vendors. And basically you get a nice box structure where you can drill down and get the stuff. 
or you can actually inspect it programmatically. And so you have top level properties like properties or, or like, so you can get, or you can get all the tables. And you know, this, once you've performed the inspection, this is like, you don't need to re-query the database to get the stuff, it's fully contained in the object. So once you get the tables, then you can get table level properties, which are the columns, the foreign keys, the primary key. So this object, we're still in database land. We're still in, you know, SQL language kind of stuff. We're not, we haven't translated it to the entity word. This is a very low level thing. Um, so yeah, so you can get the columns then you can get properties at the column level like, like this. Uh, so you, you can know, you know, what the type is. You can know what, if it has a default, if it's nullable, if it has any index and stuff like that. So. This, this lets you peek into all the really most horrible details of the database. Um, but you don't need to worry about that because once you fit this thing into an entity store, we dress up this thing with a lot of meta information. And so just to, to give you an idea, uh, I, I opened this up to, so that you can look at, uh, at what, what, what? yeah. So, so that you can look at uh, all the, at this nice box structure. Um, and things you will notice is that there is a, a bold property that's product hood. Bold means, uh, I think it's written down here, but bold means canonical name. So those are what was the primary key in the database gets promoted to the, to the, to the canonical name. Uh, and things that are underlined are virtual properties that don't really exist per se on the database and are called relations, which is something that we're gonna talk about later. But in general, if you have the arrow that's going to the right, means this is a foreign key to another table. And if the arrow is coming to the left, it means that the other table has a foreign key pointing to me. And what this, so, Many of you are like, what foreign key, what is that? But if you're used to Wolfram language, foreign key pointing to another table gets represented as an entity of another type or at the same, of the same type if the foreign key points to yourself. And if an incoming foreign key, on the other hand, represents an entity class. So many objects. So I, I think that this is a, like, we will see later why this is quite elegant and it allows you for, allows for a, very powerful querying that would otherwise require you to reason about uh, joints. Okay, so if we register the store, then we can start performing queries on it. So for example, entity value of offices, office code is like you take, the first argument is an entity class. The second argument is a single property. And so this has the, the shape of a vector and not of a matrix because we have only one property. But if you put more than, uh, one property, you can get a more complicated structure. In this case, we're getting, so we want to know where these offices are. And some of them are in the US, some of them are in other countries, but which are the ones that are in the US? So now we're putting a filter in the entity class at the beginning, and then just getting the city property out. Am I going too fast? Is this clear so far? This is very simple. Like I'm trying to give the, the stupidest examples I can think of. And there is, there is stuff like, for example, uh, this is interesting, like, so we're, we're taking, some of the offices are in a country that has states. And so we can test whether the state is now or missing. And, uh, but what, why, the reason why I put this example here is because I wanted to show you that entity function that we've seen as the function that's used as the filter X as a property here. And so the cool thing about this is that you don't have to do anything. You just put an entity function in the list of properties and you get like a, a property that's computed on the fly. Uh, again, this is all stuff that is done packaged in a single big query and then it, it comes back. So there is only one network request every time. Onward. Querying. So I told you this is like Lego bricks. I'm gonna uh, show you that it is the case. So here we want to know how many customers per city and per country we have. 
uh, I guess I don't know if that, if that in this database it makes sense to, you know, if there are, if there's a Paris, Texas and a Paris, US, but just to be safe, I'm, I'm, I'm aggregating on both of these properties and I'm getting the counts. No, I'm actually not doing that because I just, I just constructed a inert thing, this agra. If I remove this semicolon, you look at it, it didn't evaluate, it didn't do anything. It's just inert. I now pass it to entity value and I get out the account of all the customers that this company has per, uh, per city and per country. But it's not very useful like this because it's completely unsorted. And so what I do is I take the same query, I wrap sorted entity class around it, and I add descending because I want to have the biggest one first. And that's not the default, it's, it's just like in the Wolfram language. And now I can get you know, two biggest places where we have customers is Madrid and New York City. So this is like a super simple example of how these things fit into one another and you construct a query that you then um, execute only once. Questions? That's an excellent question. Yes. And it's the next slide. <laughs> so yeah, there is, a, there is this trick, uh, which is not, not very widely publicized, though, which is like the, the, you have this hidden variable, take a picture. I mean, you can download the notebook, so you will have it. You, put, you can put any function there. So if you want to log to file or you want to use print instead of echo, we don't care, do what you want. Um, but yeah, this is, this is the SQL that gets rendered. Um, and you can see, you can see basically if something you don't agree with and you want to do differently. And, and you, I mean, right now this is using SQL Lite. If I were to perform the same query on a completely different backend, you will see translated SQL to that backend. So, and that's honestly like a lot of work that's gone into that, not just by us because we are using uh, SQL Alchemy, but we have to make a lot of modifications to SQL Alchemy to make it work smoothly with the Wolfram language. And uh, as a matter of fact, might as well speak about this a little bit. Um, like behind the way that the entity function gets turned into SQL, there is a type aware compiler that basically recursively gets down into the, 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 the expression and figures out whether how to do things and whether the, the casts are necessary because Wolfram language is untyped. And so if you want to multiply two strings, you can, but you definitely cannot do that in SQL. And so like, for example, here, there's another thing where like there is something, okay, so this is an example that runs on SQLite. SQLite doesn't natively have dates. So we're storing dates as unique, ty unique timestamps. And now we want to do something which is pretty easy to do in Wolfram language, which is date value and get the week name, weekday name. Um, and, and so we want to know what customers have performed orders on a Sunday, which is like, we, we want to get rid of them because why would you work on Sundays? Uh, like you're probably gonna be an annoying customer. Or, or maybe it's a way to figure out whether the data in this database was synthetic or not. Because <laughs> So anyway, look at the mon this monster. It gets turned into a case when expression. There is like, well, there's some weird stuff like zero, zero plus, which I guess it's used to get, a, to get a, a, an automated cast um, to, to real. Uh, but then there's another cast to integer. Uh, yeah, and then, and then in the end equals seven. And then you get this whole thing there. So sometimes like even something that is kind of simple looking gets turned into a very big query and we have things that dispatch, like for example, uh, just to give a, like a super trivial example. In the Wolfram language, people are used to the fact that if you do three divided by two, they're both, both integers, it gets represented as, a, as an exact rational. Obviously SQL doesn't, doesn't do that. If you do three divided by two, you get one because it does integer division. We are assuming that people don't want to do integer division like that. If they wanted to do that, they would use the, fu the function quotient. So for integer division, there is like, for, for division, the division symbol, there is a, a number of things that we're doing depending on what the types are. And you can divide even some, some databases support intervals, which are like for us would be a quantity of type time. So you can do various operations on, on, on those. So there is a different code path so for when you're working with that stuff. And then when you get to integers, we're saying, wait, 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 this is not a quotient. 
this is an actual division. So we have first to turn them into reals, which is probably the closest thing we have to rationals. And so it gets dispatched in all different ways. So a huge amount of work went into this. Uh, and if you think you can do better, well, maybe you probably can for a single thing, but the, it gets a lot of stuff out of the way. Um, okay. So, yes. No, I didn't say that the Wolfram, I said the Wolfram language is always the same. The SQL that comes out is for SQL life. If you try to turn to run this on Postgres, it will not work. It's a different dialect of SQL. So different database vendors have different dialects of SQL, different feature support. So for example, SQL Lite doesn't really have types. Um, other uh, like Postgres, MySQL, etc., have many types uh, that do slightly different things from one another. Like the dates are not the same everywhere. Or, or there's like, there are things like, there are things that, for example, we wanted to support Windows function, window functions, but unfortunately not all backends support them. And it's kind of difficult to express in the world for language. We don't really have an equivalent. And so sometimes we got stuck with the fact that something was not supported everywhere. And so we, it was difficult to, to support for us. But in other cases, they had slightly, like you have no idea how complicated it was to implement round because everyone did round differently in <laughs> these database vendors. So to have something consistent and consistent to what you expect from the Wolfram language, we had to write code paths that were different for all the different vendors. It, the answer, so I repeat the question. The question is, if I update my database and, and there's a feature like they fix a bug and I was relying on that bug <laughs> and, or they had a feature that wasn't there, and it's uh, like breaking backwards compatibility, what happens here? So I think that to an extent, we are robust to that because uh, we are uh, using SQL Alchemy, which is very widely adopted. And so in the future, we will update versions of SQL Alchemy. And so support for newer versions will come from that. If there is an egregious bug, we hope to get it in testing. We have uh, our wonderful QA person, Dev, is on it. Uh, and, you know, if a major new version of something comes out and there's breaking changes, we hope to catch it with tests and then release an updated version of this. But of course, it, you can't really completely automate that. So uh, there is, I think uh, it's also the responsibility, like if you update your database before you do that, please stage it a little bit and, and test that we're, it's not breaking anything. Also, because maybe you are running on an older version of Mathematica, who knows? Yes. Uh, that's what the extended entity class does. You give it a name, but on the other hand, since you have no right access to the database, uh, that is gonna be um, like, uh, you, you, it's gonna be only available within that query. Right, yeah. so, so like, and this is like, okay, let me, let me give you an example. So uh, you see, we, we've done this thing where we have missing queue of state, okay? So what I'm going to do now, I'm gonna rewrite this query with extended entity class of offices. Then we take, and we say is missing, and we use this as a new property, and we put in this entity function, okay? So now this, is the office table that has grown a new, a new column that is missing. And then I can go around it and say filtered entity class of, and I, I wanna see if this works. I'm feeling is missing. <laughs> so without dressing it with the entity function, it should work, I'm not entirely sure. And then you can do something like entity count, see how many, no, yeah, it didn't work. <laughs> uh, so, Maybe this has to be entity function of O. So if you look at how it, you know, the, the thing is that Leonid is too clever for you. So the, there was an inner query that was using is missing as a named property, but it just got optimized away because it was a contrived example. So we, we, we actually constructed it in the intermediate thing 
but it got optimized away. If you actually do want to see it, you have to do something like this. This, well, yeah. You see, as is missing is, is the thing that's constructed the new named property. So yes, it, it can be done and that's what extended entity class. And it's useful because sometimes it's like, it's basically like, you're, when you're doing Wolfram language programming, you sometimes say with, and like put a variable somewhere that you're gonna reuse in a bunch of places and you want to compute only once. This is the same thing, but inside out, because you have to put it inside for it to be available outside. So you have to kind of reason in the opposite way. If is missing is present in the inside queries, then uh, I got a message in the chat. Oh, Leonid says, thanks. <laughs> He's watching us. Um, okay, so um, yeah, can I move forward? Okay, I'm gonna turn off the logger here for a second. So that it doesn't, okay. So, ah, uh, yeah, this is, this is my favorite part. Um, Christopher, you asked me a question about this the other day. <laughs> so, okay, so let's, let's look at, so this is like, this is a cool example because it's taking completely unrelated uh, uh, things in Mathematica and make them work together. So this is a, a real, an actual graph. You can compute this with this, like it's a, the head is graph. You can get the edges the, and the nodes and everything. Uh, and it's the structure of the database in terms of foreign keys. Um, and so basically you can see that, uh, for example, order details points to products and points to orders. You can see the payments points to customers. You can see the employee has a foreign key that points to itself and that's the reports to. So basically who's, who's your manager. Um, so you, you can do stuff like, like this, that is, uh, you can, you can look at it like this. And as I said, you can, you can look at it this way as well and look at these uh, arrow, arrows in the, in, the, in the boxes of the entity store. But basically what happens is that you can, have a, you can do entity value of office code from, from the employees table. And this is just the naked column. And those are, this is the foreign key in SQL. But if you do offices, then you're, you just get, are getting the foreign keys dressed up with the, with the head entity and the correct type, which is offices. So it's, it's constructing this object that is super useful. But if you go from offices to employees, so you wanna know, so this, the question of this is like, for each employee, what office do they work from? The, the opposite question is like, for each office, uh, what are, who are the employees who work from that office? And you, you do this, and you get an implicit entity class that says, give me all the employees with office code equals to one. But the really cool thing about this is that you can actually chain this. Since each of these is an entity, uh, is an entity uh, or an entity class, you, can, you, you do something like this and you can construct something that says, so you, you're getting the first and last name of, of an employee. So you start from a customer, you get out the employee as, that is the sales representative of that customer. And then you, you ask what is the manager of that employee and what's the first and last name. And so you construct this big thing that otherwise would have required two joins because you're, you're getting two related tables. And so I think it's kind of interesting to look at the difference in, in terms of SQL that's being generated. I think this is more intuitive for people who are used to functional programming, but it's this monster with a bunch of sub queries. Um, and if you look at this one, which is the equivalent with combined entity class. So this has one join here and another join here. So it's, it's just two different ways of reasoning about it. I tend to find the, the one with, with relation to be a little bit more intuitive, but you have both, you can do both ways. And another thing that is really cool is that you can, you can actually follow also the, the reverse relations, which would normally lead to something that is like forbidden in SQL because you get stuff that is, uh, you know, you, ca you cannot return a vector as a value for a column. And, and what, you, what you get here is basically, so you, okay, this is, what is this? This is, you start from one order, the order number 10,100, and you take 
So each order is, is related to a table which has the order details, which are like the lines in the order. And for each line, you have the price for the item and the quantity that's ordered. And so you're like doing, uh, multiplying these two vectors, element by element, the, the price and the quantity, and then you're computing the total. So you're effectively performing an aggregation without doing the aggregation, because you're doing it with, uh, with this, um, with this subquery, basically. So it's, it's like, again, if you wanted to do this in normal SQL, you would have done, gone on the, on the order detail table. You have done, would have done a group by, two group, one group by, and then a multiplication, and then a total. Uh, this is uh, like a much simpler way to reason about it. And I think it's one of the key things where, you know, you, you, you don't want to use SQL here uh, directly because it's like, it takes much longer to think about at least unless you're doing SQL every day in your life and you think like SQL already. Are, are there questions about this part? Yes. It will not know it for you. So I'm gonna repeat a bit of the question. The question is like, it is common sometimes to have details and or pre-aggregated tables because otherwise you get too computationally expensive to do all the aggregations on the fly. And the, the problem is that a lot of that logic is like your business logic. And there is no metadata that we can read that, that tells us that this, this table is the actual materialized aggregation of this other table. I think that the, there are features of SQL, like there, there, there is this thing called the materialized view, which could, keeps the, the, the meta information about how the view was created. We don't support it yet. But if you were to do things in a, a little bit different, the, there might be a chance that we can read that meta information. But that would also require being able to parse SQL and turn it back into this expression, which is yet another can of worms because one thing is generating SQL, parsing SQL from five different vendors and, and turn it into, back into entities is a lot more complicated in, as a computational problem. Yes, Brad. That's an excellent question. So Brad asks, what are the advantages of using SQL instead of an association? And I would like to answer with a quote from Star Wars. This is a weapon from a much more civilized, civilized age. Uh, so SQL is like, uh, you, you, you really can't compare the two because uh, an association is bound to always be in memory. And so it's limited by the memory of your machine. Of course, if your data is small enough, the association is much more powerful because you have all the rich structures of the Wolfram language. But so if you go look in the page for new in 12, there is an example where I'm using a, a, a data set that is larger than a terabyte. And we're performing queries in uh, less than 10 seconds on a data set that is one terabyte large because mm, SQL is optimized for that. It's a, the other thing is like, so this is one, one case, like stuff that you wouldn't literally be able to fit in the memory. And the other case is uh, atomicity and concurrency. You have a website where there's a hundred people per second coming and making changes to a state. Think about, I don't know, think about um, Airbnb and people making reservation to places. That's like a giant database table with the reservation of people. And like each time somebody connects to, to their website, they're, when they pay and make the reservation, there's something that changes and you have to make sure to update the state of the apartment so that nobody rents it at the same time. This type of concurrency is something that is very hard to do with something like an association and that SQL has now almost 50 years of history of being able to do that. So, yes, but it's, you're not, so I'm gonna again repeat the question. The question is, if you have a parallel algorithm that shares the memory and is searching for something, sure, you can use an association, but not the reason people use uh, SQL are often situations where the data is also changing while you do that. And so in general, I mean, we are, uh, Roman is working on that stuff. I don't know if he has talked about it this year, but there is stuff like locks. So that if you're using a parallel algorithm, you can make sure that the operation that you perform is anatomic. But in general, again, 
SQL is designed, and not all SQLs are designed for like data science kind of workflows. Some dialects of SQL are better at that, but in general, what SQL is very good at is like concurrent, atomic access. <clears throat> you can do things like sharding. You can put like half a database on one server, half of the database in another server. You can have replication. It's like, it's very, very much of an industrial thing compared to an association. So association is fine. It's much faster. If the data is small and you're the only person using it, you can definitely do things with an association. But don't run a website of an association. At least not one that has many people visiting at the same time. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, uh, so it's, a, it's an excellent question. So uh, the question is, what, what do you have for profiling? If I can summarize. So there are things that look surprisingly similar in SQL, but one is terribly efficient and one is super fast. Um, so do we have tooling for that? A little in that in the relation, when you perform the inspection, you can get meta information about whether or not there are indices, it will list those for you. On the other hand, we haven't yet, I guess, if you go like convince Steven that it's worth spending time on it, we haven't found ways of exposing things like explain. Also because not all backends support them. So, so ask, for those who don't know, SQL, in SQL, there's this thing called explain that is going to kind of do a dry run of a query and tell you what parts can be can give performance problems. But exposing that in a way that is user-friendly and symbolic across different vendors is kind of a big project and we haven't tackled it yet. But if there is enough adoption, maybe they'll give us, I mean, I, I, it's something I would love to work on. <laughs> I think it's super interesting, but I, I don't know. And also like maybe automatically using that kind of information to change the query in a way or in another. Uh, so far, this stuff is still at some, somewhat an experimental level. I think there are, there are like features that are more important than that, such as writing to databases or using a different mental model for, so there is, a, I don't know, I, I, I'll talk about this, but if you tell someone else, I'll have to kill you. There, there is currently an internal effort in trying to see if it's possible, for example, to compile things that are written for data set into SQL queries. It looks like in many cases it's possible. And, and that, that, that is like a very algebraically complicated project because it, data set is inherently hierarchical whereas SQL keeps, always keeps this nice table structure. And so I think there, there are more people who want that than people who need something like that or would be able to read it when it came out. So maybe it's not at the top of our priority list, but it's a project I would, like to, would really love to work on. I don't know if we'll get a chance to do it. Um, yeah. So I, I'm gonna move to, what do you do if there's something that, oh, something that we don't support and that you need. Uh, so we have, we have this thing that's called embedded SQL. Well, it's actually two things, not one. There is an embedded SQL expression, which is an expression. So it works, uh, maybe some of you remember em embedded HTML. That's something that we built for cloud when you wanted to have verbatim HTML in your, in your cloud stuff. This is kind of the same. Like there are some things, for example, this date functionality, SQL Lite is very weird because it doesn't support dates as objects, but it has probably the best, um, the best stuff uh, for 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 doing computation with dates of all the other backends. So in this case, like we start from now, then we go to the beginning of the year, then we go to the month of June, and then we take the first Sunday of June, and we want to know what that is. And and this is something you can do by writing something like that in in SQL Lite. So we do this. And we get, no, it's now six months is July. So the 3rd of July was the first Sunday of July. And it's, you know, in this case, it's like just inserting the SQL verbatim. And, and this is a kind of a stupid example because it's like, it's just putting a string into a function. But the, the cool thing is that this supports like binding from the rest of the query. And so you can inject things in it, like as if it was a template. And so for example, in this case, I'm like, I'm using this uh, glob pattern matching for strings. 
to get to figure out what countries so glob the native glob in sqlite since they don't have booleans returns one and zeros but so you i want to know what countries start with a capital u and i can write the pattern this way and uh, you, you get out like this nice little list and as you can see it's it's smart enough to know how to insert the right thing in the right place so we went from something that is dressed as a property and inserted it into the template as the named column. So I think this is kind of nice. Um, so, so this is for expression level things. So things that go into an entity function in general, but it, you can also have things that go at the query level. So something that we do, do not support out of the box is with recursive. And this is the way you write a factorial in SQL. So it's like co iteratively constructing this recursive table. Um, and then it gives you the, the factorial. If you give two higher numbers, you see that SQLite is not Mathematica. And at some point you just break out of integers and get reals. But um, such is the limitation of SQL. Um, so uh, and this, this thing, like this thing, like recursive queries is again, a very powerful tool that is not supported everywhere and it's kind of difficult to expose natively in the Wolfram language, but it's useful to do things. I mean, in a sense, we do expose it in Sparkle because Sparkle uses this kind of stuff to do um, the, I think it's called the transitive closure. So if you're asking question like, instead of asking the question as like, who's your manager? You're, you're asking like, who's your manager, 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 until you get to the point of a person that doesn't have any managers or you want to know the list of all the persons that are under me in a tree. That's the kind of st stuff you can do only with recursion like this. Um, okay, but if you suppose you don't want to construct a query that can then be fit into another query, because the whole thing about this is that once you have this expression, this is another Lego brick that has properties that you can use. And so if you wanted to like then call filter density class on this, you, you can, if you want to call, you you know, you want to make a join with another table, this works just like any other entity class. So everything is composable here. And again, it also supports like feeding into it uh, template slots from data that comes from other queries. But if you want completely abstract, uh, complete, completely arbitrary stuff, there is external evaluate that, and this ties in with the workshop that, that was yesterday. And here I'm just constructing. So if you do SQL light of nothing, this is an in memory database. I create a table of developers. There's a name, there's whether or not they're awesome. I insert two values. I am awesome, don't know if it's not awesome. And then I'm selecting the ones who are awesome. And it, you get out this nice little data set. So this is like entirely arbitrary stuff. Uh, so if you are a, an expert on SQL, but you still want to get your data into a notebook, this is probably the best way for you to do it because you get the, you get the advantage of like a nice smooth uh, conversion into the native types of Mathematica that with the transport that is as optimized as possible. So we try to keep things packed in transit and so on, um, even if there are nulls. So we reinsert the nulls afterwards, um, but you can write any SQL you want and you can actually also get it. Is there, isn't there like a, the cell thing? Yeah, so you can just do this. Go to SQL and then you have a thing where you can type select. Select star or something. I don't know what database this is connected to right now. So select two. Yeah, I don't have it registered. That's why I didn't want to evaluate it. So. Uh, greater than questions not yet store procedure was the question no not yet okay thank you